if you're just tuning in, we know there's a lot happening in our world right now that we don't understand. We have a caller on the line. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. My hope for the next 25 minutes is that you encounter the living God, that regardless of what's happening at home right now or wherever you're viewing this service, regardless of what's going on in your life, I pray that God shows up in your life in a big way today. Now to start this conversation, I thought I'd start with a simple observation that I've seen as of late. Whether you're on social media or the general news, this is something that I have observed. Everybody has something to say. Everybody has something to say. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody is an expert. There's so much chatter in my newsfeed, and it's beginning to look like an elementary school playground with name calling and, and bickering and, and tattletaling. This past week, I got a chance to go to Niagara Falls with my family, and whenever we have somewhat of a mini road trip, you can be sure that backseat shenanigans will begin to take place. Will you change the song, please? Or, or don't touch me. Or, or mom, she's being mean to me. And so what happens, well, my wife will then turn around and begin to speak over the children. And so likely what's taking place is the, the two-year-old crying, the five and the seven-year-old are bickering, and the mom's talking all, over all three of them. And the pinnacle is when I can't take it anymore because I can't even focus focus on the road. So now I'm talking over everybody else. And soon enough, everybody is talking at the same time. And it just seems to me that that's what's taking place in our world right now. But think about this. When everybody's talking, nobody's listening. When everybody's talking, nobody's listening. Most of us have been here before. You can probably recall past family get-togethers, especially around the holidays. You say the right sensitive subject and everybody starts to talk over one another. Or if you've experienced work conflict and in a meeting where things get tense and everybody starts talking over one another. Or if you've ever been to a town hall meeting, one person says something, gets everybody fired up, and sooner or later, everybody is talking and nobody's listening. And that's not a conversation. You see, let's define that word conversation. A conversation is two or more people exchanging ideas. Now, I'll illustrate it this way. Conversation should take place like this, that I have something to say, I say my piece, and then I pass the ball to someone else. They grab the ball, and then they speak. They share their thoughts, their ideas, why they might agree or they might disagree. And then you pass the ball to someone else. That's how a conversation should take place, where two or more people are exchanging ideas. Instead, my observation is that most people approach conversations these days like it's a dodgeball match. Think about it this way. So you go in to a conversation geared up, ready to throw down. And the only thing that matters is that you come out victorious. I know I probably look ridiculous right now, but when the heat goes up, the fun should go up. And it's summertime, so we should have fun in church. And so you enter into the dodgeball match with your opinions, with your ideas, with your objections, with your pains and your frustrations, and you enter the conversation and you're just chucking your ideas at anybody to see who you can pick off and aim, ready, fire, shoot at next. That's how we're approaching conversations. But there's a problem with this. And since most of you already understand this, this shouldn't be that difficult to understand, but here's reality. When nobody's listening, the only words that we remember are our own. We get so focused on trying to get our point across that we can't even remember what other points were made in that conversation. 
And this is the approach that Habakkuk has been making in this conversation that he's having with God. Habakkuk is a, a prophet in the Old Testament. And he calls up much like a, a caller would call on a radio show where God's a special guest. And he begins to say, hey, God, I've got these problems that I want you to explain. And he gets done and God begins to explain. And no sooner that God gets done, does Habakkuk jump right back in. And this is the exchange that they're having right now. But Habakkuk's approach is so similar to the way that you and I approach conversations. Oftentimes we approach a conversation much like a game of jump rope. Do you remember jump rope back in the day? See, in a conversation, you're watching and you're not really listening or trying to remember the points. You're just trying to jump in whenever someone stops to catch a breath. So you remember jump rope, you're looking back and forth, you're looking back and forth, and then you jump in and you go around and that's, that's how you do jump rope. And that's how we approach conversations. We're not really listening. We're just looking to jump in to the conversation. But today, I want us to consider another approach, something different than maybe the approach that Habakkuk took in his conversation with God and the approach that many of us take with those that we might say are enemies or have different viewpoints or worldviews. You see, today I want us to consider what would happen. What if we stopped talking, started listening, and focused on remembering? What if we stopped talking, started listening, and focused on remembering? This means that when you enter into a conversation and you are divided around the issue of politics, you might stop talking, start listening, and focus on remembering. Or if you enter in a conversation and you're divided around the issue of COVID, or you enter into a conversation and you're divided about the social injustices that are taking place, or maybe, and I know this is sensitive because it's fresh, maybe you enter in a conversation and there's opposing views as to whether or not we should resume on-site services. You see, this approach says something to the person that you're having a conversation with. It says, you matter to me, that you have value. I want to know how you think. I want to know why you think that way. Tell me about your frustrations. Tell me about your pain. Tell me about your struggles. Tell me about your heartaches. But Habakkuk is approaching this conversation much like many of us. And in the midst of just trying to get his point across, he has forgotten some important things that he knows to be true about God. And so in this conversation, here's what begins to take place. Once God finally gets a chance to jump in and respond to Habakkuk's concerns about his enemy, the Babylonians, God begins to explain that justice is coming. He says, will not all of them taunt him with the ridicule and scorn saying, now him is the, the Babylonians, the great enemy. And God's saying, there's gonna come a time where this taunting is, begin, is gonna begin to take place. That as my justice begins to take place for this enemy of yours, something's going to take place. A conversation is beginning to take place. Now, you might not be a Bible scholar or a Bible expert, but you would understand this word here, taunts. And if you're a sports junkie like myself, you've been experiencing withdrawals as of late. And you're hoping maybe baseball's coming. You're hoping maybe basketball's coming. You're hoping maybe football's coming. But one of the things that I miss about sporting events are those opportunities where you get to taunt your opponents. Now, if you're watching a game of baseball and the pitcher gets yanked from the game because they're getting shellacked, and the manager comes out, he says, give me the lefty, or he says, give me the righty. You know what everybody in the stadium yells out? Na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. Now, if you're at a hockey game and there's an intense moment, this one is fun. They play the Queen song, and you hear the, the, the stadium just begin to erupt. You hear the... We will, we will rock you. And in this moment, everybody's erupting as you're taunting the, uh, the opponents. And it's fun. Well, this is what's happening right here. This is, these are five taunt songs. These are, these are frustrations that God has with the enemy. 
the Babylonians. And through these five woes, God begins to explain these frustrations. Now, if you've never heard of this term before, a woe is simply an oh no. Woes in the Old Testament are oh no's. This is similar to when you're growing up and you would say something under your breath to your parents as you walked away and they would say, oh no, you didn't. Or maybe you came home past curfew and they would say, oh no, you didn't. Or maybe you took the parent's credit card and went and charged some stuff up on it. They would say, oh no, you didn't. But the difference here is that these are more than just mistakes. The type of woes that God is talking about here, apart from the saving grace of Christ, are punishable by death. Here's the first woe, greed. God says to Habakkuk of the Babylonians, woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. You see, it starts off by maybe bending the rules a little bit, cooking the books a little bit, but then this mentality grows into a mafia-like mentality, which says, I need to grow my wealth at all costs. And this is what happened with the Babylonians. What started as a little became a lot, where it was all about their financial gain and whoever stood in the way that they would just simply take out. Now the next woe, uh, exploitation. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain. This is that person that might be uh, at the top of the corporate ladder, but, but how you got there matters because if you had to give up your integrity along the way, that's a problem. If you had to lie and scheme and steal and manipulate to get there, then that is a problem. Woe number three would be murder. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Now this is sensitive because the truth is, is that so many nations, so many great uh, groups, so many great people groups that have been successful in history, like the Greeks and the Romans, climb their way to the top through bloodshed and war to advance, to grow their kingdom. And God says, Woe to him like the Babylonians who builds a city with bloodshed. Now, another woe would be sexual abuse. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. Now, isn't it a shame? Isn't it a uh, tragedy that thousands of years later, there's nothing new under the sun? that even today, people still use substances to take advantage of other human beings sexually. The fifth woe is idolatry. It says, woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Now, of all of these, this is where I can find myself struggling with idolatry, which is to worship anything or anyone other than the one true God. Now, I experience this this weakness, this temptation, whenever I drive by one of my dream vehicles. Take a look at this guy right here. It's a Ford 150 Raptor, totally blacked out, decked out to the nines. Looks good. And so I say to my wife, as I drive by a vehicle like this and say, I would look good in that truck. And my wife will say, what do you need a truck for? And I say, well, you know, to, to, to carry stuff you know, to to put a load in the back. And she says, yeah, you're carrying a load of something. She says, no, seriously, you're a pastor. Why do you need a truck? I said, I'll put my sheep. I'll put my sheep in the back of the truck and and (laughs) drive them around. No, seriously, I look at a car like this and and the warm fuzzies come to mind. Like, oh, if if I had a truck like that, then, you know, I would feel so much better about life. Have you ever told lies to yourself? You know, if I had that house, or, you know, if I was married to that person or if I had kids like them, then I'd have life all figured out. That's what, that's what idolatry is. It's worshiping someone or something else other than the one true God and trying to get fulfillment from that. And when we step into that, we're no different than God's people in the Old Testament that worship a golden calf, worshiping someone or something other than the one true God. And this is the temptation that we all face. Now, after God rolls out these five taunt songs in the form of woes, He doesn't stop there. He says, listen, not only do I see the injustice, I'm going to do something about it. He says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And this is the good news because this is the part of the story where we're reminded that Jesus is coming back. 
This is part of the story where we're reminded that greed will be wiped away, that exploitation will be no more, that murder will come to an end, that sexual abuse will come to an end, and that our struggle with idolatry, that temptation will be removed when Jesus returns and all of the earth is filled with the knowledge of his glory. But in this moment, this is also a reminder that right now, even in the midst of this brokenness, for those of you that are at home online behind the screen that are experiencing the hurt and frustration and brokenness of the world, this truth also is a reminder that this is as close to heaven as you'll ever get, apart from the saving grace of Christ. And for those of us that would say, I've given my life to Jesus. He's my Lord and my Savior and to the best of my ability. I'm committed to his will and his way. The good news for you and the good news for me is that in the midst of all of this pain and frustration and the greed and the idolatry and the exploitation and the sexual abuse and the murder and the midst of all of that, the good news is, is that this is as close to hell as that we'll ever experience and that something better is coming for us. Now I say all I have to say, and if you're that person that hasn't declared Christ as your savior yet, I wanna invite you to consider taking that step to discovering purpose because Jesus is the one that you are looking for. If Jesus is that fulfillment that you're hungry for, when you enter into a relationship with Christ, all of a sudden you discover that you are known, loved, and accepted. So what would it take you to take that next step? Now, after God drops the mic and says, not only am I going to deal with the injustices, that there's going to be a better day ahead. After he drops the mic and says, what say you, sir, to Habakkuk? Here's what Habakkuk does next. Here's what he pens down. The Lord in his holy temple, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. So God gets done. He speaks his peace. He's in his holy temple. And then Habakkuk declares, let all the earth be silent before him. So in the midst of all of his wrestling with God, what he learns is, here's the prescription for God's people. You know what, I, you, know what you need? <laughs> is you need to stop talking and start listening. You need some silence. You need to get away and remember who God is. See, in the midst of the silence, something begins to take place in Habakkuk's heart. All of a sudden, his memory goes into all, all, all gears and it's firing in all cylinders and his memory jolts his thinking. And here's what he says. The Lord, I have, uh, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. In other words, now I remember I had forgotten when I was having that conversation and my focus was all about trying to get my point across, I had forgotten who you are. Now I remember your beauty. Now I remember your majesty. Now I remember all of the great things that you have accomplished. Now I remember all of the great things that you promise to do. I have heard of your fame. I know your resume. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Now it's a posture of worship. But Habakkuk then says, hey, God, you know what? While I've got you on the line, there's something else I have to say. Repeat them in our day. Bring back those deeds that I've heard about. I'm hungry for you to step in in this moment. In our time, make them known. God, will you make your ways known again? Habakkuk's discovered that it's better that God does the talking and that he does the listening. And he's asking God to share his fame once again. But for Habakkuk to get to this place, here's what had to happen. He stopped talking. He started listening. And he focused, he focused on remembering. I had a moment like this recently. I was at home, working from home. And a frustrating moment in the workday. And when this usually happens to me, I'll do one of a few things. I'll go for a walk around the neighborhood or I'll go in my backyard and do laps. In fact, if you've ever s- spoken with me on the phone before, you might hear some like sloshing of my feet in the grass. That's what's happening is I'm, I'm doing laps <laughs> in my backyard or I'll call up a friend and process. But none of those options were available this day because it was hot and it was sunny and I'm a bald man. And so when the sun hits my head, it's like solar power. I mean, it's just all kinds of things happen. And even if I put a hat, it just seems like I attract the sun's energy. So I wanted to stay inside. But in that moment, 
something happened that I hadn't experienced in a little bit. Silence. See, my wife had taken the kiddos to go swimming at a friend's house, and it was just me at home. Now, I've never heard God's audible voice, but I heard a pastor describe it, uh, a conversation with God in this way. He calls it spirit-led introspection. And that he goes before the Lord and says, God, would you remind me of who you are? And the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart. And the Holy Spirit begins to trigger the things that you know to be true about God. The Holy Spirit begins to trigger God's fame and his resume and what he's done. And in that moment, you have a Habakkuk moment, which you say, oh, that's right. I have heard of your fame. And then your heart shifts to this place and your mind shifts to this place and says, God, I need more of that. I need you to show up right here in this moment. Now in the New Testament, there's a story where Jesus is casting out demons. And there's a story that he's teaching about spiritual warfare and that this battle that takes place behind the scenes, we can't see it in the physical reality, but it's there. And he says that there's an importance in remembering that we can be attacked by a spiritual enemy. And as he is teaching with authority, people are gathering. You see, Jesus was a celebrity of his time. People followed him. And there was a woman in the crowd that said, you, you know, your mom's blessed. We love you, Jesus. Your mom must be so proud. Look at you teaching with authority, doing great things in the name of the Lord. She must be a blessed, blessed woman. And then Jesus responds to this woman in this way. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's to say, Right there in that moment, she was witnessing God do a great work. Right there in that moment, she was witnessing Jesus teaching in the flesh with authority and clarity. But he says, even better than just hearing the word of God is keeping it to, to allow it to integrate into your thinking and how you live your life and how you love other people. You see, the point that I think that Jesus is making is this that what we remember affects how we think. And how we think affects how we act. Now, your memory is a gift. And your memory can either serve in one of two ways. The first way is that your memory can serve as a filing cabinet. There are so many great things that happen to us in our life, and we archive them away. We don't want to forget them, but we don't need to remember them every day. So like the filing cabinet in your home, it's just buried away collecting dust, important items that you can't throw away because it's a birth certificate or it's your social security card. So you put it in the filing cabinet and it collects dust. It's within reach, but you don't access it very often. And when it comes to your memory, it might be things that you experienced in high school. You're thinking, man, high school was so long ago. But you can't remember all of the names, but you can remember some. And you can more remember the, how you felt in certain experiences. And so you haven't buried those memories away. They're accessible, but they're more like collecting dust. And sometimes when it comes to what God has done in our life, we treat who God is and his fame and his resume like the filing cabinet. We put it away and it's kind of there, but we don't access it very often. But there's a second way that we can approach our memory. We can treat our memory like a toolbox. You see, your toolbox is always nearby. When something breaks down in your home, you go and grab your toolbox. Or you need to install something in your house. So you grab your toolbox and you take that tool out and you put that tool back in. And your toolbox is always there when you need it most. So when it comes to your memory, there are things in your toolbox like your anniversary, the date of your anniversary, or I hope it is in your toolbox. Because it's an important thing that you want to access regularly or your kids' birthdays or that memory of the day that your child came into the world. Well, what Jesus is saying is that God's word, when it comes to how we connect with our enemies and how we relate to our enemies, that God's word should be on the forefront of our mind, that it should be in that toolbox that we have close by so that we can access it, take it out, and put it back in when we need it most. And Habakkuk has discovered this in his relationship with God. So here's what Habakkuk said. He said, repeat your great work once again. This is a prayer. Repeat them in our day, in our, ta make, in our time. Make your deeds, make your wonder known. 
isn't this a prayer that we're hungry for right now? That right now in the midst of COVID, in the midst of a divided nation politically, in the midst of civil unrest, in the midst of not knowing what's gonna happen this fall, if you're a Jesus person, you're praying this prayer, God, make yourself known. We need you to show up. We need you to show up in a mighty and amazing way. Now, last week, I issued a a challenge that when it comes to our enemies, those that are intentionally committed to our harm, that Jesus said that we should pray for those that persecute us, that Jesus said that we should love our enemies as he has loved us. And that we should view our enemies through the wounds of Christ. And that when we see our enemy, instead of seeing all of the hurt and pain that they caused us, that we would remember that we're no more worthy of God's grace than our enemies. And to view our enemies through the the lens of what Christ did for us on the cross and that we too need to extend grace. But if you're like me and you listen to a message like that, you probably walk away saying, well, some things are easier said than done because that's not my gravitational pull. That's not where I drift to naturally. But for us to get to this point where we can engage our enemies in this way, it takes these three steps. We got to stop talking. We got to start listening. And we've got to focus on remembering. God's word tells us that he's going to bring about justice one day. That he will remove the injustice of this world. God's word tells us that he's aware of the injustices that take place around us. But God's word also reminds us that there are times where God puts us in, some, puts us in the, the path of someone else's life so that they could experience God's grace and mercy through us. So this means that the next time you enter into a conversation, don't treat it, don't treat it like a dodgeball match. Don't enter into that conversation locked and ready to fire away your opinions Your thoughts, your insults, just take out all of your pain on that person. Instead, instead, enter into that conversation ready to listen, to say, help me to understand your perspective. We might not see eye to eye, but help me to discover your pains and what matter to you. And to begin that pass, that ball back and forth. Now, if you're not of faith, and you tuned in today because maybe somebody invited you to tune in and you're just curious about who God is, we're glad that you tuned in today. But my hope and prayer for you is that you would continue to pursue Christ's love and the patience that he has for you and that you might consider following him in a way that you have not yet. But for the rest of us, the easy next steps this week are three things. Stop talking, start listening, and focus on remembering. Like I said last week, can you imagine what might begin to take place in the lives of those around us? If we did these three things, we're going to grow in knowledge of who God is. And as a result, those around us are going to experience God's love in a way that they never have through us because we are committed, committed to remembering who God is. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing one more song this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and your truth and the reminder today that there are times that we enter into a conversation with you and the only thing that we want to do is vent. But so much comes from taking a step back and listening to what you have to say through the words that you've already spoken, through the pages of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So in the midst of a a divided nation, in the midst of divided friendships, in the midst of even divided churches, we ask that you would show up in the same way that Habakkuk asked that you would show up and repeat your works once more. We ask that you would do that once again. The years from now, we would look back and say, I remember when God showed up in my life in a major way. The years from now, we would remember that I remember when God showed up in our church in a major way. The years from now, we would remember that God showed up in our country in a major way and that we would tell those stories to our grandchildren. (sighs) Would you make that happen? In the power of your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. We're gonna continue this morning. I'm gonna turn things back over to Trevin and the band.